Good morning, everybody. I'm Paul Revel. I excuse the husky voice. Um, I'm recovering my voice, but I'm otherwise fine. Um, we're here to talk today about learning gaps. We've been talking about learning gaps for a long time, but we're here to talk about learning gaps with an even greater sense of urgency because of what's happened over the course of the pandemic. Uh, so it's not a new subject, um, but we've got some new thinking going on in terms of how we cope with how we respond to these learning gaps. I saw an editorial, uh, not an editorial, it was actually a news article in the Boston Globe the other day, uh, and it, it raised the question, what if they can't catch up? And I thought it was just the wrong question, actually, because we know they can catch up. We know they're capable of catching up. Uh, the important thing is it's up to us as adults to provide them with the opportunities to catch up. And, and that's really what we're here to talk about today is um, how do we provide those opportunities? What do those strategies look like? How do we ensure that they, that they, they work? But it isn't just about it isn't just about instructional strategy. This isn't just purely a technical instructional issue. It's also about taking into account impediments to uh, the effective implementation of these strategies. Ecosystem problems like pervasive mental health issues and trauma that's been experienced by so many of our children and their families. Um, the inertia of our legacy system, in other words, its inability to transform itself or to modify even in the face of a clear crisis uh, that we have at the current moment. The need of that system to differentiate and not treat all children as though their experience in this pandemic has been the same. In short, we need a holistic approach to accelerate learning. And that's exactly what we want to talk about today. And we've got a great panel uh, with which to do that. So I welcome the panel and thank you for joining us. Um, uh, Tom Kane is the Walter H. Gale Professor of Education and Economics at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And he's the director of our Center for Education Policy and Research. Sonia Sanalises is the CEO of the Baltimore City Public Schools. Uh, and Penny Schwinn is the Commissioner of Education for Tennessee. So let's get right to this important conversation. And uh, before I sit down, I'll just raise the first question here, which I want to ask each of our panelists if they take two or three minutes to talk with us um, about their definition of the problem. What are the challenges that you see in your work, either on the ground or in the analysis of what's going on, um, what's, the, what's the problem, and, uh, and something of a hint about what you think the framework is for solving this. So, Sonia, why don't we start on the front lines with you? Sure, thanks, and I will just say it is wonderful to be back um, here at Hugsy. It is surreal, which I was saying to some of my colleagues slash former professors. Um, I'm used to being out there, and that was a lot more comfortable um, <laughs> than sometimes being up here. So um, quickly, what I think the challenge, if I can try to um, summarize or be concise about it, I think the challenge we're facing now is actually the complexity of academic need um, and mental health, as Paul referenced, and the actual uh, DNA of schools to be able to respond um, to a real complexity of need. If you look at a large number of our students in Baltimore City and their profile of student exists throughout this country, you, we also are facing um, kind of the compounded impact of the economy um, and the stressors that I think previously, it might have been Kent or Peggy, I know said earlier, um, kind of the, the conundrum of we weren't addressing some of those issues great before, and now we have kind of a compounded need. What I would quickly say, and I'm glad there's a timer so I won't be long, um, is that I actually think one of the major levers that we are focusing on um, is what I call the healing power of doing school well, of not asking second grade teachers to now be therapists, of not asking principals to solve food supply chain issues, but of actually doing school well and making way for the whole community to be able to support instead of educators feeling as if 
we now have to do everything. And I think that's part of at least where we are focusing um, our energy in, in, in the aggregate. Thank you, Sonia, for that. Oops. Are we too close? Uh, am I sitting too close? Yes, no. I, I think you're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Penny, how about from a state perspective? Yeah, so I, I think the state's a little bit different. So for a state, we have urban, suburban, and rural. And all three have had very different experiences. So in Tennessee, we have districts who were never really closed outside of the first couple of months in March of 2020. And we have districts who were back open um, literally for the last couple of years. But the, the specificity of need for different students and student groups not just within dis between districts, but also within districts and individual schools. So you think about some achievement gaps um, between students with disabilities, our English learners, students who are economically disadvantaged that have widened because of, of what we've experienced with the pandemic. I think, frankly, the thing that I'm most concerned about is the energy. Um, it was a lot of how do we get through it, and now that we are kind of through it, we, we aren't done. Um, health is in the same building as us, and they're like, whew, wasn't that something? And I was like, it sure is something. We're still going. Um, and it, it is that idea of how do we make sure that our educators, our general assembly members, parents, the community understand that we are still in the middle of recovery and have that sense of possibility, the energy, um, the urgency to try to continue to do the hard work really, really well. And I think with the federal funds that, that certainly have come in, how do we invest those funds, not in the aggregate, but really thinking about each individual child and what each individual child needs and understanding that that's going to be a longer term investment um, and certainly a much longer term strategy that's gonna be necessary at the state level. So trying to balance that so it's not a one size fits all because that doesn't work, it didn't work and it's not going to work in the future. So how do we help districts to really think thoughtfully about how they invest their funding, how we do so in a way that's going to have sustainable and consistent impact for every single student and how we keep the energy up and what that strategy is going to look like. Because we are talking about several years of recovery. If we do it well, we're talking about decades of recovery if we don't do it well. Um, and I deeply believe we can do this well and, and get um, back to where we were and better off if we do, if we make those <coughs> decisions now. Thank you for that call with the continuing work. Tom? So <clears throat> back in the early 60s when President Kennedy issued challenge. NASA's rocket engineers sat down and calculated what's the magnitude of thrust they were going to need to generate, to send a um, lunar capsule, all the food and water that the astronauts were going to need, all the humans. And they realized, all the way to the moon, they realized, my goodness, like this is going to require a whole new rocket design, a totally different rocket design than we currently have. It wasn't a matter of just adding a little extra fuel to the rocket designs that they had. In education, what I've seen, so we're working with like uh, 12 districts that are planning interventions this year, and what, what I've been seeing is more like shooting bottle rockets at the moon. Like, directionally correct, but nobody is doing the calculation on what's the magnitude of intervention we're going to need. So, for instance, we're seeing a number of districts that are trying uh, tutoring interventions. Um, even among the districts that are most aggressive in terms of their tutoring interventions that, that we're working with, the average district is providing like 30 hours of, intervent of, of tutoring to those students, and they're maybe providing 10 or 15 percent of students with, with tutors. 30 hours over a year. Over a year. Now, somebody needs to just sit down and do the math on, we, we have efficacy estimates for many of these interventions, including high dosage tutoring, and we should be calculating, okay, given those effect sizes, and given the losses that students have suffered since 2019, what is a combination of interventions which at least on paper has a chance to, to close the gap? If districts did that calculation, what they would discover is that they will need almost all of the 
at least the, the high poverty districts that were closed for much of 2021, they will need almost all of the federal aid that they have to pay for tutoring, extending the school year, vacation academies, summer school. And I'm afraid that that, that realization will come too, too late. So, so we, we need to be thinking more like, you know, NASA rocket engineers calculating what's the magnitude of, of, of effort that we need to uh, launch um, and not continue to, to just sort of <clears throat> shoot bottle rockets at the moon, which are just sort of directionally correct, but nowhere near enough to, to, to get there. I like your, your metaphor of rocket design, and each of you have commented in some way. I mean, Penny said one size fits all doesn't work. Sonia said we can't keep layering these things on schools that they need to do. And Tom, you've talked you know, even, even the quantity of time available in order to do the kinds of interventions that are important. I guess one question that we'll come back to, but I'd, I'd welcome comments now if you had comments, is how do we generate the public will in this moment? We have kind of a moment of crisis. As you've all said, we've had gaps for a long time, and we haven't been terribly effective at closing them. Now the gaps are wider than ever and, and affect different populations more deeply than others. If this isn't the moment, what is? And what do we need to do to take advantage of this moment to generate the public will for the kind of transformative change that your comments suggest? I mean, I'll jump in because that's, that's a tough one. I think at the state level, um, the fact of the matter is that we're back in person is kind of the win for a lot of families. You know, I've got three little kids. And so doing school at home while we were trying to also do work, and I mean, I went in seven days a week, it's a different kind of job, but my husband trying to balance that um, is really hard. And there is a parent strain and drain that has, is very real for a lot of folks, and we've seen lots of data on that. And so when we talk about kind of being back in person and the return to quote unquote normalcy, it's really hard, again, that same kind of urgency, if we're not through this yet, it is hard to keep the engine going and really stepping on the gas that we've got to continue to really focus on this. And so for us, we'll have a flash in the pan. You know, we had the long-term trend data um, from NAEP that was a couple of months ago and lots of legislators talked about it. Um, some districts talked about it. But for families, the polling that we're seeing in Tennessee, and I think there's some, um, a, a several universities have done this, is there, there isn't really that sense of urgency right now. It's, you know, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. And part of that is fatigue. And so, and I think, you know, another part of that is, well, what do we do about it? How do I, as a mom who might be working, um, of parents who are looking for work, parents who have multiple jobs, how do I balance the strain and stress of what's happened over the pandemic? and then also worry about whether or not my child is as good or better off, that's a lot for someone to carry without really, really clear solutions. So as a state, our district, and the community, we have to work together to say, this is the strategy, we're working the plan, here is what your role can be to really help your child. But I, I do think that, that that drain is very real for folks. So yeah. I, I think that it is what Penny is describing, parental sense that things are back to normal mm -hmm. uh, and kids will be fine, is the biggest constraint on districts taking more aggressive action. For instance, I, I cannot imagine, um, after doing some of these uh, calculations, most districts being able to close the gap without adding time, either extending the school year, using school vacation weeks, getting a lot more kids to show up at summer school. I just can't imagine that happening without the, that package of things. And yet, it'll be, it's parents, um, you know, parents need to be on board with that or else a, it'll be very hard for a district superintendent to, to announce and ask for any of those additional uh, asks uh, uh, of parents without more of a, uh, a consensus. One thing that we're doing um, that hopefully we'll be releasing in a couple of weeks will be district level estimates of achievement losses. Penny mentioned that, that there's the long-term trend, NAEP, 
uh, that came out in, in August. There's the NAEP scores that are going to be coming out on October 24th. Um, that will bring achievement losses back into the headlines and people's consciousness, but still it'll seem distant. Um, and so we're going to try to bring it closer to home by translating the, the NAEP scores into district level losses to, to help parents see, hey, wait a minute, like, you know, um, here's the magnitude of the decline in my district. Uh, maybe I ought to be asking questions about, like, whether my, my kid is covering the standards they ought to be covering given the grade that they're in. So, so, Sonia, I, just, just before you talk, I, I, I wanted to, you know, I love your concept of the healing power of doing school well. And what you suggested is there are limits to what school people can do. We're, and we're already asking them to achieve world class standards um, with basically the same essentials as they've always been given. And on top of it, to solve all these other problems, which as compassionate individuals they've tried to solve um, but haven't been able to do so. Um, as you talk about this question of public will, I wonder if you see the will in the rest of the community to redefine a social compact in terms of what our community owes to our children and the school's role is here, doing certain kinds of things and the rest of the community there. Do you see any movement on that kind of thing now? I, I actually do. I think I'm very fortunate, very blessed to be in the state of Maryland where we passed new school funding prior to COVID. So I want to make that real clear. Prior to inflation, prior to all of the economic pressures we have. So, you know, I'm also a realist. Let's hope it holds. What it has afforded schools the ability to be able to do, at least in Baltimore City, is that we now have a concentration of poverty um, allocation. And one real way that that hits schools and that challenge, Paul, is that now there's actually funding for community school coordinators. Now, in full disclosure, like I'm an academician, I'm like, four years ago, why do we need community school coordinators? <laughs> well, I know in stereo why we need community <laughs> school coordinators. Because those people actually do a better job. They're closer to the community. They don't drive home outside of Baltimore City. They live, they know what, where the resources are. They have the personal and community connections. And so those community school coordinators are helping to find clothing, helping to find housing helping mom, dad, grandma get connected to the mental health resources. So now the second grade teacher who is looking at the Dibbles data can actually focus on the Dibbles data, right. right? And there's someone else within the school to not say those things shouldn't matter, just press through, but to say, I can actually help with that. And what we're hearing from our families is that meeting of need, and I think this gets to the other question we were talking about, if we want to communicate the urgency with families and parents, we also have to have two-way listening. Mm -hmm. So often, and you know, look, I do it too, because I sit in a seat where it's real easy to say, okay, what is it we want people to do today? And if they could just do what I want them to do, then this thing would be fixed. And that's not what we are finding. We're finding that out of the 22,000 summer learning, we didn't call it summer school, seats that we offered, we didn't get all 22,000 filled, but the first time we did it, we had 6,000 families this past summer. We had 17,000 families. And what we found was more successful was when at the local level, meaning at the school level, we leveraged two-way conversations, and actually we are finding that families are concerned about where their young people are. It's just, I think, as, as Penny was saying, that there are all these other stressors. Mm -hmm. So if we can take, kind of have the resources or the connection to the resources at schools, what we're finding in one of our schools, Hartford Heights, we were there with the deputy secretary. It's in one of the low SES economic, you know, demographic areas in Baltimore City. And out of a school of, say, 380 students, they had 185 students show up for summer learning at their school, but what they also heard from parents 
was, look, I get the reading and the math are behind, but to the mental health piece, I've got a kid at home that's breaking down in tears. I've got a kid at home who experienced trauma because when we closed schools, we forgot the importance of schools. And I don't want to get into the school politics of closing and all that, but to be frank, I'm not sure what we thought we were going to find when you keep kids out of relationships for two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in, in some respect, our focus has been on how do we provide the support, the direction, and the resources for local schools to make those connections. And what we're looking at when we, and I do think that, look, Tom is right. Like at the district level, we have to be able to know our district outcomes. But what I have found, particularly in black and brown, communities that have large tracts of underperformance, as Baltimore City does, we are deaf to that because everything that comes out talks about lack. My parents don't want to hear anymore. You come in and tell me how urgent it is because everything in Baltimore City is on fire. What they want to hear and what they respond to is when you say Sonia is sitting in second grade she missed mm -hmm. half of K, she missed all of first grade, and her third grade reading, her second grade reading placement is at pre-primer. And this is what this means, mama. And mama breaks down in tears, real story, real parent we talked to with the deputy secretary, who was tearing, and what, when she started bringing her student to the hour long per week tutoring, right, it wasn't just Oh, 30, because Tom's right. We had to prioritize. That mother now is breaking down in tears because after a summer, mm -hmm. when she got her other needs met, she now knows her baby can read on grade level. She doesn't care about the aggregate. She cares about where my child is. And mm -hmm. where we're seeing the lift is where you can build it at a local level and have reciprocal listening. Thank you for your math score. Thank you for your verbal score. I want to know, does my child have band? Do they have an art class? Do they have the place to learn how to play baseball? That's what our families told us. And we had the advantage of having longer term money. Let's hope Maryland holds. Mohammed, you heard me, right? Like we got a hold on the Kerwin investment because unlike my colleagues, I'm not looking at a cliff. I'm looking at Great one-time money, but I know I've got a 10-year ride down the line with the new school funding formula that allows me to put those other things in place. But I do think we've got to get in a posture of reciprocal listening, because this telling me my neighborhood's on fire, telling me my kid's behind, is not resonating with my parents. They're like, you always tell us we are less than. Mm -hmm. Why don't you listen to me, and then I will buy into what your plan is to move my child. And one last thing, because I know I'm taking too much time, is I do think that there is a posture that certain people don't care about their kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that is true, but that's true at all economic levels. Mm -hmm. Right? I've been to a whole lot of schools in my lifetime, some that have educated president's children. And the difference is the safety net. So let's not assume everybody doesn't care about whether their kids are behind. You need the mental space to think you have something to do about it and know where those resources are. But we shut people down, and then we want to know why adult violence is up in my schools. You know why? Because people's nerves are frayed. And for you to just continue to tell me I'm less than and I'm behind and there is nothing that you have for me to do, then no, I actually don't want to hear mm -hmm. any more about that. And I think that's where, at least from a local level, that's where we're seeing the lift. The schools that can do that are getting parents out and are getting <clears throat> in. Well, that's a clue to how to do some of that design work that Tom is talking about. Yeah. I mean, what we talk about the Education Redesign Lab is meet them where they are, give them what they need inside and outside of school. Every child should have a plan. Every child should have a navigator to help them, the community coordinator kind of person. Go ahead, Tom. So the message about the losses is less for parents, and it's more for district leaders. So 
district leaders need to recognize just the magnitude of resources they need to be setting aside. Um, so for instance, if, if I were to calculate, like say if I, I, I've lost 40% of a school year in terms of, like if I take my achievement losses and convert it into months of instruction, say I calculate, you know, it's a, I've lost 40% of a school year. I should not expect that it's gonna be anything less than 40% of my typical instructional year budget in order to pay for that catch up. Now, 40% of a typical annual year's budget is about 100% of the, um, the American Rescue Plan money in many districts, not 20%. So, as, as, so the, in, under federal law, districts are required to spend 20% of their American Rescue Plan money on academic catch up. That's gonna be confusing for many districts because that's gonna be nowhere near en enough. So, so districts need to start with plans that are commensurate with yeah. the losses. And ideally, you know, we need some success stories for other districts to follow. One, one of the th problems right now is high dosage tutoring is the one message that is effectively gotten out there and yet not every district is gonna be able to do high dosage tutoring at the scale that's necessary. So if we could get some districts to pilot some big interventions this spring or next summer, pair it with some evaluations so that we can convince everybody else elsewhere around the country about which of these things worked, that would be the way like, that, that we, could, we could just hopefully inspire m much more of a catch-up effort that, than we've seen so far. And, and I totally agree with you, Sonia. Somehow we need to do this in a way that people see excited, right. are excited by and um, empowered by and not just sort of a one more alarm. Hopefully the district leaders hear the alarm. Yeah. But but families right. should should be that shouldn't be the primary message to families. We've we've touched on the ESSER money and and Tom you alluded to strategy here. So let let's bring the lens down a little bit and talk about it, at least for the instructional piece what's working on the ground. You you mentioned things beyond tutoring that that districts ought to be thinking about investing in. I want to ask you what the research shows us and then. You know, Penny and Sonia, what they're finding on the ground is working in their jurisdictions. But Tom, why don't you lead us off? What, what's the research telling us works and we should be spending as their money on? So, um, so again, I think it'd be worthwhile for a district to start with, okay, here's an estimate of the number of weeks our students effectively lost. And then convert the efficacy estimates of different interventions into the same unit. So for instance, High dosage tutoring generates the equivalent of about 19 weeks or basically half a school year's worth of, of growth. So for a lot of kids, if they got high dosage tutoring for a full year, that would be about 108 hours, not, not 30 hours of mm -hmm. tutoring. That might be enough to close the gap for a lot of kids. Um, but districts are gonna to struggle to implement high dosage tutoring at the scale necessary. So, so what are some of the other things? Another is double dose math. Uh, so doubling, providing kids with an extra period of math instruction during the day. Prior studies have suggested that generates about 10 weeks worth of learning, not as high as, as 19, um, uh, uh, but, but okay, but at least that, you, might be, might be able to offer that to a larger share of kids. Summer school, um, the prior research implies it generates about five weeks worth of learning. Now, I'm citing these numbers not, not to imply that, oh, this is just a mechanical exercise um, and districts can count on generating that magnitude gain because it's gonna be hard to, implement a high quality tutoring program in, uh, um, in this environment. But just to, so that people start to get a plan that at least on paper is enough. And then 
okay, if it turns out the catch-up is going better than we expected, we could scale back next year. Um, but uh, but uh, if we don't start with, with a set of interventions that even on paper are way too small to get there, we're going to... We're going to find out next, summer, next year, this time, that kids are still way behind. And then and at that point, the problem is there's only one more year for, to use the federal, federal dollars. And, um, and if, so the sooner we get started on a larger scale catch up effort, the, the better off we'll all be. Penny, how about you? How are you spending your ESSER funds and what are you finding is most promising work best? Yeah, so I, I think for at the state level, we're thinking about it um, with the three-legged stool. So one of the challenges is when it's just about spending the dollars. So we're saying you have to have the funding, you actually have to have long-term policy attached to that funding to have lasting impact, and then the impl implementation has to be really strong. So for the state, because we've got districts, and each district has their own plan at the local level, we can't, we, we can't have 147 districts all doing the same thing. We kept it really narrow. So we had five things. Anything on the other hand, you kind of slap down. You only get five. That's what my team tells me. Um, and so we really focused on early literacy. We saw that because that wasn't tested and we had universal screeners, we were seeing that actually some of the students who were most impacted, to Sonia's point, were our kinders and first graders and second graders. My, my daughter was a kindergartner and she started school remotely. She had a very different experience than my older daughter, um, and that's with two teachers at home. And so we, we spent um, about a third of our dollars on training. Every single um, elementary school teacher in the state of Tennessee will have some kind of phonics-based science of reading, knowledge-building curriculum to go with that. <coughs> Um, training and support, districts opted into networks of support. We are seeing really, really strong gains there, but we said we have to focus on our little ones to make sure they are reading on grade level by third grade, period. Full stop, that has got to be the priority. If students are not reading on grade level by third grade, they're four times more likely to drop out of high school, and with some of the other things that we've seen, we understand the life impact of that. Second has been acceleration. So for us in Tennessee, that really was two things. It's summer school, and it's um, our high dosage tutoring. Again, we had Tennessee Literacy Success Act. That was the policy for our early literacy work. That was in January of 2021. It was the first state to do um, pandemic related legislation for education. We also had the Student Acceleration Act, and what that did is it funded summer school, and we call them camps too, so not school, they're camps. Um, camps about math, um, and so um, we really focused on that, and that is forevermore. So that's state funding. That wasn't the federal funding. It was state funding for the long-term commitment using ESSER as the launching pad for that. We had about 25% of our elementary school students participate last year. We did not see a big drop um, in this last summer. We also had about 20% over the course of these last two summers of our middle school students. So we saw the participation was there and it really did address not just math and reading, but also some of the mental health supports that really needed to be in place. Tennessee All Core is our big bet on, on um, high dosage tutoring. We've got about a million students in the state. Um, we used ESSER funding for 150,000 of them to receive high dosage tutoring. Plus, we have additional micro-grants for families so they can have early literacy tutoring on their own schedule and community grants because we recognize that some schools just are not staffed to provide high dosage tutoring. It is very intensive on the staffing side. So some of our United Ways, our Boys and Girls Clubs, our YMCAs, when they offer summer programming and after school supports, they should also be able to not just do homework help, but do high dosage tutoring. Let's make those minutes effective for students so they get the same training and resources. But ultimately what we've seen is we started this as a state in January of this last year. The ESSER funding was about eight months before that and procurement takes about, about eight months. Um, we started that across the state and we are seeing that those districts that implement well are seeing significant acceleration between January 22 and May of 22. M more acceleration than we've ever seen as a state. What we saw though is that now we have policy and long-term state funding to support tutoring forevermore. It is not just right now. It is saying this is a best practice. We have to rethink how we do RTI or those response intervention blocks. How do we use the time and minutes we have with kids so we don't stick them in a center on a computer and not really actually think about what we're doing with the time that they're in those seats. Let's make every single minute matter for every kid with where they're at. The third is um, really thinking about our teachers. Um, there's a shortage, we keep talking about the shortage. We are really trying to make sure that we are using our ESSER dollars so that every single child has a very experienced teacher in front of them every single day. 
We cannot continue to talk about the impending doom of not having enough people to fill those seats. The time is right now. We've got students in college. We have high school students who are still figuring out what they want to do. Let's remove the financial barriers to becoming a teacher. Let's diversify the profession so it reflects the students that, that our teachers are serving. And let's get rid of the idea of a first year teacher. So now we used our federal dollars to have an apprenticeship program in partnership with the US Department of Education and US Department of Labor. You can become a teacher for free while you are paid to do so. It allows for us to really eliminate shortages and it means that you have two years of practice under a master or mentor teacher before your first day. My first day is gonna, it, it looked a lot different than the future teachers in Tennessee. It was me shaking with my high school students in, in the great city of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and they are wonderful and they turned out just fine. Um, but, <laughs> um, but they will, but our future students will be even better off because they will have that really strong. And then the last thing um, that I, I just have to give credit to our General Assembly um, for is we redid our funding formula in the middle of a pandemic because we saw that we had about a billion dollars a year coming in federal relief funds. And in order to continue the investments that we see are working with kids, and they are working, our data is showing that we are back to pre-pandemic levels in English language arts in our spring testing data. Again, six months after we started, not the January results in our mid-year, but after we started the acceleration efforts, our le legislature said a billion dollars a year more for public education in the state of Tennessee to address the needs of individual students, concentration of poverty, students with disabilities have a 20% increase in funding, tutoring will be funded forevermore, summer camps will be funded forevermore, and early literacy will now be funded for every single elementary school student so that they can have smaller class sizes, more programming, and actually have the materials they need to succeed. But that's, that's it's gonna take that at a minimum. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'll say is that it's not easy. And I think it, there's no silver bullet. It's not like you just say, well, just do it. <laughs> Schools, just do the hard thing. This is really, really hard, very time intensive, and requires a lot of people on the ground doing good work, all moving in the same direction. And we cannot underscore enough as states and I think as districts to say this is very hard for a very long time, but we have to approach it not if we can do it or if we will do it, but how we will do it. And that's what we say over and over. It's not if, it's how. And so understanding and validating that it's hard, doing the right thing and making sure we're looking in the data to make sure it works, having the money, the policy and the implementation and not giving up but continuing to move forward. It's the minimum expectation we have to have of ourselves if we're gonna do right by kids. Thank you for that. Tony? Yeah, and I, I do just wanna emphasize the fact that what Penny described is occurring at the state level, which releases <coughs> LEAs or local superintendents to then focus deeply on implementation. And I don't think that that is a minor thing. So when we talk about the levels of leadership, both from a research perspective, a policy perspective, um, and then locally and at school level, I think it's important to know that that role from a sitting superintendent's perspective is not minor. Because we're investing in some of the same legs, mm -hmm. right? So, but, but we're doing a lot of the research on the ground, right? So we don't have a state teacher, uh, a state tutor corps, we have to come up with our tutoring. And so what that means is we're investing some of our dollars and we have been monitoring which tutoring is yielding results. Because I think to Tom's point, I mean, one of the things we had to do, because um, we started virtual tutoring actually in spring of 2000, like the winter of 2019 into 20. Because I, again, for those of us who were on the ground, I'm actually not surprised um, at the data. But I will say, we're now having to develop our own internal evaluation and assessment of the quality of the tutoring programs. So we've shed some, right? We have increased others. But where you're gonna get the tutors, how you monitor the data on the tutoring, how you ensure, and Tom is right, that the dosage is at the right level, I just need folks to know that's all sitting in a school district as opposed to sitting at the state. And so when we talk about appropriate roles at appropriate levels, I think that's gonna be one of the key learnings that comes out of this time. The other piece on the early literacy that I think needs to be emphasized uh, to me as emblematic of, it's time to focus 
on what the high leverage instructional strategies are. Like to, to continue to have reading debates, and I say this with knowing Pamela Snow is in the room, like to continue to have debates is absolutely asinine at this particular time. I don't have time for it anymore. And like I've told folks, if you don't believe what the science says about how kids learn to read, there are plenty of other districts you can go to. Our kids don't have time for it. And so the fact that like the state is championing that, and you know, shout out to Superintendent Chowdhury because he's also investing in some of those, I think that there's gotta be alignment between what all of the levers are that policy makers are putting in place. Because the power of knowing that you've got the state taking some of that load, so we can go deep on implementation, and you know that there's the money. And let me tell you, there's a lot of urban soups that are not in Tennessee and not in Baltimore City that are wondering what's gonna happen if they build this infrastructure and there's a cliff, and we all know, because many of us have bent Kent McGuire's ear on this, we know we are going to get blamed for mismanagement. If we, come on, it is that part. Particularly those of us who sit in this space on underrepresented and resourced communities if this does not work. My staff is tired of me saying, you know they're gonna blame the sister in the seat if y'all misuse this money. So let's get it right. Let's focus on what we need to have the focus be. And I think to Tom's point, you have to understand under-resourced communities are using some of this money to patch buildings, right? So it's one thing to say, and I completely agree, like we're not, we're doing more than 20%, right? So we got 44 million in ESSER dollars, 18 million of that is allocated just for tutoring. Right? And then we've got another like 14 million allocated for, I would say, extended time. It's not even about summer. It's about how do we build extended time. We're looking at like Aldean, Texas. Shout out to Latanya Goffney. Like she had five to 10 schools that she took to year round, not by mandating it, but saying where are the schools that need it. And she's seeing as well that level of acceleration when we move to year round schooling. That all takes money. And you can't do that if you also have to worry about bad school buildings and trying to use money to patch that. So one, early on in the pandemic, states and the federal government were so eager to get these dollars out, understandably, because we, we were in the midst of a crisis, that there were very few strings attached in terms of data to be collected. So believe it or not, there are a lot of districts that can't do what Sonia was just describing of tracking which kids were getting tutoring or which kids were, went to summer uh, learning or camp um, <laughs> um, or which kids were going to the after school program. Yet those are the data that will be critical for just trying to figure out which things are, are working and which aren't. So this is something that states, um, Sonia, as you're suggesting, this is a role for states to identify some of these promising programs, pilot them this spring or this summer, pair it with like a, a plan for evaluating it, and then get the evidence out to the districts in their state, but also to districts around the country about which kinds of things are, are working. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity for states to give districts an opportunity to innovate, but in this case, innovate with an evaluation, you know, com, you know <coughs> combined with it, so that we can say something later to convince skeptics on which of these things worked and, and, and some, some won't work, but, but let's, let's see which ones do and let's elevate those. It's important to note, and I'm glad you pointed it out, Sonia. I mean, we're, we're dealing with, well, really, I mean, if you think of yourself as Massachusetts or myself as Massachusetts, three exceptional states with Tennessee, Maryland, and Massachusetts, so they're outliers. So that's not gonna be the typical experience. The typical experience is more like the blame that you were talking about earlier. And so I'm, you know, since we brought up the state role, I'm interested in, you know, from a policy perspective. And as we think about, we've just been talking about some of the instructional strategies. 
But we've all alluded to the other factors in the environment, the mental health problems, the relational problems, the schools being asked to do too many things. What are, what are policy changes or uh, significant budgetary changes that you're either seeing in your state or would like to see in order to make some of the system changes to mitigate those things that get in the way of kids coming to school or being ready to learn when they get there and relieve teachers of the burden of having to deal with a whole variety of other factors rather than deal with the academic work that they were called to, uh, to address. I will just shout out mental health. Mm -hmm. um, the ability of our Department of Health to support us is minimal. Mm -hmm. And not because they're horrible people and they are gifted professionals, but we have got to have a different system mm -hmm. of getting young people the mental health uh, support that they need. The difference in where my, my sister lives in Massachusetts in a high performing school district and one of the things she said to me during the pandemic is the difference between the kids in my neighborhood and yours, Sonia, is that my kids have <coughs> private therapists that are built into their schedule. They leave their AP Calc class, go to therapy and come back. Your kids are asked to just suck it up and press through. And like we've got to be able to get that support in ways that don't require it to only come out of school funding. Quick comments, because we're almost out of time. But Yeah, so I'll, I'll say briefly, I think one is crop agency. So our um, Governor Lee and General Assembly, we have a mental health trust fund now using state funds, a quarter of a billion dollars to pilot programs in public schools, see what works, and then invest in them. We also redid our funding formula, of course, to be able to support mental health um, in schools. And I think that funding formula is really allowing for districts to frankly invest in where it is needed. And then in our mental health agency, we now have a county-based um, person in, ev in every single county that does school-based mental health and coordinates with all of the providers within that county. Because remember, America's not just urban America, it's rural America, and we've got counties that do not have a hospital. We have counties that do not have a single mental health professional in the entire county, and so it looks different. So telehealth, how do we have traveling <coughs> supports? Because it is all of our students who need that. Um, but I do think the funding and the connectivity is going to be incredibly important. And the only other thing I will say is we cannot forget our high school and our middle school students um, in the conversation. And so what mental health looks like for them is not always going to be the same as for elementary. And frankly, what we are hearing from our students, our children, is that they actually need school to look different. They do not want to go and sit in desks and stare at the front of the room. That is not actually going to help solve some of the challenges they're facing. So if I think forward about what school can be, Imagine going to high school and you are actually getting work-based learning and apprenticeships because you want to be a teacher and now you're in a classroom. You want to be a welder. You want to be a doctor. You are going and experiencing the job of the future. You might even be getting paid to do so, but you are getting access and opportunity and working in a field and working with your, with your fellow students in a high-rigor environment and getting the mental health supports that you need. We have to rethink and re-envision what school looks like for all of our kids. I actually think that's part of, part of the solution, not just what we bring in for those kind of one-off appointments and supports. It has to be a redesign for the kids we have now, not the kids who existed 20 or 30 years ago. It's really important to do that in this moment. Thank you. Tom, last word quickly. So <clears throat> this pandemic did not affect every kid equally. Mm -hmm. There's been a remarkable, we already had inequity in 2019, but the inequity we had in 2019 is much worse today. Um, and it's on us, it's on all of us to revert that. Um, and, and as Penny was describing, we have a, we're not gonna get it done in one year, but we need to get it done in a, in, in a two or three years or else um, uh, kids will be, um, permanently uh, behind it and uh, it'll be on us if that happens um, it'll it'll be it'll be our fault because the federal government has provided the resources um, and uh, if we can't manage to get our kids <coughs> organized to use those resources to close the gaps it, it, it's on us well as we started it's a, it's a holistic strategy that I think we're all talking about it's not it's not just improving instruction, but it's addressing all these needs that arise from the ecosystem and the differential experiences that, are, that families are having. So this notion of redesigning not just education, but child development mm -hmm. 
with a design principle of meet them where they are and give them what they need. And that's, that's where I think we need to head. I want to thank um, the panelists not only for being here today and sharing your wisdom and insights with us, but for your public service, for your leadership, particularly the two of you who are on the front line at state level, at the district level, and Tom, for all the research that you uh, provide to shed some light on what's going on out there. Thank you all for your public service, but especially thank, thank you for you. being with us today.